Hello everyone, Saku you here. And I'm Gabby. And welcome back to the podcast, my hoes. You probably noticed if you're watching this on YouTube right now that things look very different in here from what they usually do. And the reason for that is because we are currently down in Florida at my parents' place. So yeah, very, very different office setup. This is this is not a very fancy garage, if anything. <laughs> or it would be the most fancy garage. Also, my mic, um, this cable isn't the greatest. So if I cut out at some point, that's um that's on him. Yeah, for anyone that watched the YouTube video that I put out here on the channel, here for the History of Everything podcast, they noticed multiple things got spliced together because at random points, the mic would drop. We're, we're getting that fixed. We're getting that fixed. But anyway, I'm sure you're listening to this on New Year's. And I just want to remind you guys that we do have trips, like spots for our trip to Peru and Italy this year. So if you want to get those, you know, sign up ASAP. We're down to like, I think, five spots left for Italy. Yeah, for Italy, I think final payments are doing like, what, two and a half months, basically? Here, it's getting close, and there's only a couple spots left. So if you want to secure something, make sure to click our links. But anyway, speaking of traveling into far off regions of the world here, the thing that I wanted to talk about today is I wanted to talk about something very different. Because we've focused largely on a lot of American stuff and European stuff for the past several months, just because it's things that people have requested. But I really wanted to cover another part of the world. And I was trying to think, what could I possibly talk about that is fun and spicy? And I thought spicy. And that made me think of India. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I had to, okay? That's the pun was sol- there. Solid thought process. Yes, okay. okay. And I thought like, okay, there's so many different things in India that we could talk about. What would be even spicier, all right? Because there's literally thousands of different kingdoms. And I thought, well, at the one point where it was basically unified under different stuff was under the British. And if you want to talk spicy history and the British in India, well, there's an infinite number of things that you can pull from. So what I wanted to talk about today was the Sepoy Rebellion, one of the largest rebellions that had ever occurred in history. And this was specifically where there were mass rebellions all across India against British rule in India. I say, I say mass rebellions, but it's more like though it did appear among the common folk, we're talking about the military itself that was controlling India on behalf of the British East India Company rises up against it. And it is as a direct result of that, that the British would end up having to take things over directly with the crown. Okay. I was so confused. I was like, the British East India Company was controlling India. What? Yeah. Oh my God. Wait, hold on. I did, thought did, it was just the British Empire. Did we do an episode on them? For this no, we yet? did um, the Dole Pineapple Company and we did the Dutch, Dutch. East. In, yeah, we did the Dutch. Yeah, the Vok, which was the Dutch one. Okay, so for clarification, for we're going to establish this here, the British East India Company, for a period of around, what, 150 years, essentially, were the default rulers of India. I say so that. So the, the corporation ruled the country. Pretty much, pretty that's, much. That's solid. That sounds like yeah. it worked out well. At one point in time, the British East India Company had one of the largest armies in the world. Like the company had a military. The company had a military that was necessary in order to protect its interests and also to expand its control. Yeah. Talk about a military industrial complex. The British East India Company is the definition of a military industrial complex. It truly was. It is also thanks to different actions from the British East India Company and what they did for enforcing uh, the way certain crops would be grown is that a lot of sustenance farming was removed out of certain parts of India in order to be able to grow more stuff for cash crops, which on one hand, for the people who would grow it, yay, hey, good, okay, we're making money. We get to trade as part of this massive empire. Awesome. But for the people who needed the food for sustenance. <laughs> when a famine hits and there's way less food that is being produced, oh, okay, now we have a little bit of a problem here. It's really interesting, though, because in my classes, we actually look at that a lot, where a lot of countries have been taken over by companies, essentially, that completely destroy the land. They took away, like, the subsistence lifestyle that the locals use, and they turned it into exactly that, like a giant, like, industry like agricultural industry. And it just- You covered that with Hawaii a lot, didn't you? Yeah, it was Hawaii. There were like a lot of different places I covered over the course of last semester. And it is always terrible because once they completely drain the land of all resources, now the people who are depending on, you know, the subsistence, the food, they have none. There's nothing. So now they have to relocate or figure out a different type of way to make money. And it's it's a lot. (laughs) Oh, no, absolutely. And that's kind of what ends up happening here. So this isn't going to be the only factor that contributes to the crown having to step in and say, okay, hey, company, you're no longer in charge. We're taking everything over now. But it is 
it happens very, very shortly after. I mean, we're talking within a couple of years of this. And so it's one of those things that is directly related from just how badly the whole thing was managed. Okay. Well, you're just keeping, where's the rebellion come in? Like you're keeping us okay. in suspense. Yes, I am. I am. All right. So we're going to the details of this, right? The rebellion was something that ultimately was quashed, but the name, the very name of what we are talking about here is something that is a little bit contentious because people will call it like the great Indian uprising. They will call it the Sepoy rebellion, the Sepoy mutiny. There's a lot of different names that go with it. I've heard the great Indian uprising actually. Mm -hmm. So there's a variety of different things that people describe because even within modern India today, there are a number of politicians that harken back to this because it's a big national event. People try to ascribe larger connotations to this thing than what there actually were, as in like, okay, oh, this was a rebellion by the sepoys, yes, but it was also a massive uprising of nationalistic pride of Indians against their British oppressors, which was not true. Like, that's not true at all, because India, even as an idea, didn't really exist at that point. It wouldn't be until the actual rise of like pan-Indo nationalism that you would start to see from World War I and World War II that India would take a hold as an idea among common people. Because here's the thing. The sepoys, the people that we were talking about, were not just one group of people. They were composed of Indians from all across the country who served underneath the British, but there were large pockets of people who had a large tendency to serve, to serve. Like you saw a lot in Bengal, you saw a lot of Sikhs, you saw a lot of Punjabis, you saw a lot of these different people who would be serving because for them, that was like the best option that they really had because there wasn't really as much work for them. And so when these people rise up and they start taking things over, you start to see this major course of division among ranks of there are some princes that exist in India that are siding with them. There are others that are neutral and there are others that are actually siding with the British because they prefer that over the mass rebellion, carnage, and chaos that was occurring during the rebellion. So it varies. The name itself is quite contentious, but we're going to need to get into kind of explain this and what it is that you all think. You can put down in the comment section below. Tell us what you think, whether it was something like who you would side with, if anything, the neutrals, the pros, or the against. You know, just what would it be? Swear to God, the amount of people that we could potentially it's, see in the comment section yeah. that are going to start fighting over that. The comment section is going to be a mess. Thank you. <laughs> That's going to be our poll in the Sepoy Rebellion. Who do you <laughs> side with? <gasps> okay, here we go. So the Sepoys are the start of all this in the East India Company. I'm going to need to kind of explain them here in the first place. So although the East India Company, this is the confusion that you had from the beginning here, although it was established as a trading company, right? from the mid 18th century, it would expand and employ its own military forces in order to be able to protect and govern the territory that it would rule over. And this happened quite a lot over the course of the 18th century. So from 1765, only people that were British, so the, only the ones who were like actual European officers were allowed to be officers within the East India Company. The, the rank and file, the people who were mostly on the ground and, and would do any kind of fighting or actual security police work. Were Indian. They were mostly Indian. And I think from the ratio of what I was looking at here is that in the late 1700s, we're talking about a ratio of seven Indians to every one European rank and file. That's going to end well. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, these troops are going to be hugely important to everything the East India Company does. And they were first known as, and if, if anyone has seen this, for like a, a lower ranking term for, I'm mean, going to hazard a guess for this, because I was shocked when I first saw this, a lower ranking minion for like an evil entity or supervillain or something, w w a peon. Like, you know how peon like is like, like when you call someone a peon, it's like a lower. Like I've never just heard a, that before. You've never heard that term? I don't typically call people lower. <laughs> So typically it's something it's it's one of those old terms that is very hierarchical that people would look down on others, like referring to them as nothing more than a peon, like basically a pawn, essentially. I've heard right? pawn. Yes. Okay, I've heard pawn. So they would they would call them like peons at first, and that in and of itself would come from a um a more bastardized variance. And I know I had it in here. Where was it? The Persian term 
Sipahi. So Sepoy to Sipahi. And as I said, they far outnumber the European soldiers. Many Indians at the time here, you're wondering why would they join up with the British here in the first place? The answer was for better pay, for better life, for better opportunities, because large swaths of India was still overwhelmingly agricultural. And with the massive amount of cheap labor that you get pretty much anywhere else, there wasn't really much competition for them back home, or rather not wasn't much. There was so much competition that they didn't really have as many opportunities to do things. So a lot of them would go and sign up with the East India Company because it offered them better housing, better pay, especially if they were like a fourth or fifth son within a family. Because that is so interesting because even like it's, it's less now, but even today when people are like, OK, I don't have many options. Guess I'll join the military. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the East India Company, of course, it has to rely on them. And then simultaneously, they are trying to get as many Europeans as they can come in in order to oversee things. But it's hard because you have to pay people to you have to try and entice them to travel halfway across the entire world and then set up shop in a foreign country overseeing things like away from your friends, family, everything forever. Not just as Wait, forever. I mean, for the time that I you're actually they're working retired. There, a number of them were. Are they got vacation days, right? No, oh, no, Dissy, that varies when we're talking about No PTO? Jobs. No PTO, no employees. I'm sorry. L- listen, listen, it varies. Now, you could go on leave. That was still technically a thing. But what would end up happening with the British, right, is that a lot of them, the officers that would serve in the East India Company, were former British army men. And what would happen is that they, later on in their life or whatever, would try to be, uh, they, they would try to be re-enticed with, like, a higher commission or whatever to go overseas. It's kind of like what would happen within, say, this happens within modern militaries where people retire from militaries and then they get offered big contractual bonuses and all this stuff to either re-enlist, re-enlist with a regular yeah. or they end up going and working as a mercenary, like with a private military corporation or a security firm. See, that sounds kind of fun because you get to do the same thing without all the extra rules. Yeah, that's what happens. And also getting sent a lot more potential, you know, like to like a long term war because mercenaries, how often do you see them in a long term war? They go in, they go out, you know? Fair enough. And that's usually what would end up happening with them, though. A whole history of all the varying things with mercenaries would also be fun. And I want to do that as a YouTube video, but I also want to do that as a podcast video. Why not both? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Why not both? So either way, the sepoys were very well trained, especially considering the day and age where they were for foreign troops in comparison to the European armies. So these would be crucial to helping the East India Company take control of everything. Um, They were used heavily in the Anglo-Mysore Wars, the two Anglo-Sikh Wars. And at the time of the mutiny, when all this broke out, the EIC employed something along the lines of 45,000 just British soldiers. But remember what we're talking about, that ratio. So if it's 45,000 European and 230 thousand sepoys were Were the sepoys treated well because you said they got better housing and pay in comparison to the average say indian peasant but that doesn't mean that it's good and one of the big problems because there's a lot of causes that lead into this rebellion and that's we're going to be getting into next because oh my god does it get nasty okay so what caused the rebellion a lot of things so have you heard of that whole, um, and this is what everyone, and they talk about the Sepoy Rebellion. They pull this up constantly here. Was it the, working conditions? Sort of, yes. But remember the greased, do you remember that story about the greased fat cartridges? That story about, because remember, Hindus and Muslim, what are animals that they cannot consume or touch? Cows, so, mm-hmm. pigs. There you go. So yeah, that's two. So the big thing that people love to reference when they talk about the Sepoy Rebellion is that there were cartridges that were being delivered that, you know, to load your gun, you tear off the cartridge with your mouth, pour in the contents, which is black powder and the the bullet, and then you cram it down with the ramrod. So the grease that would keep those packages fresh, well, grease comes from somewhere, right? That's OZ, there's the problem. We're going to get into that. The rumors started going around everywhere across India that they were made of either cows or it was made of pork. Like pigs, either one for one of the sides, considering the number of Hindus and Muslims that lived in India would be a massive, massive problem, right? Yeah. That was something that literally wasn't allowed. But as it turns out, and we're going to be getting into that, 
when the details of it finally come out, that didn't happen. It was just a lie. That was a lie. That was straight up a rumor that people took as truth. And that was the feather that broke the camel's back, so to speak. I mean, it definitely wasn't a feather for, for a lot of these people. Uh, like, I, I know this from the amount of times that we have worked around varying things with Muslims. And we know that the consumption of pork for Muslims, like that is something that is like that, that is a guarantee to hell, basically, or depending on how orthodox you are, that is a horrible thing for them. So that's uh, that would be like the British were damning their own soldiers, which is a huge religious no, no, so to speak. So in addition to that whole thing, the sepoys were already unhappy with pay inequalities because they were receiving, and the numbers that I found vary. Sometimes it was 20%, sometimes it was half, sometimes it was only 80%, which is not as big of a difference, but it varies upon where they were. The short of it is that there were vast pay differences between if you were a sepoy soldier or a British soldier, right? So the literal... um what would the term? Systemic racism. That was a systemic racism thing in that there were key differences in pay. Sepoys were, of course, suspicious that the rifle cartridges used animal fats that they weren't allowed to actually consume. Uh, another thing that they were against was having to serve abroad, especially among the Hindus. That was a big thing. Depending upon how orthodox you are and depending upon the region of where you were located, within Hinduism, there are many sects that are literally not allowed to leave India. Yeah, because, well, um, I have a friend like that. It's based on your religion. If you're yes. a Hindu outside of India, then you're not truly a Hindu. And it even comes up in, you know, my country because we're West Indian. So there's a lot of Indians from India that live there. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, you know, ethnic. They're, they're from India in the past. Anyway. They are very strong, like devout Hindus, but there's always that little chip on their shoulder. Just kind of like it comes up a lot in their religion where they go back to India a lot to do a lot of prayers and stuff just because yes. of the fact that they aren't in India. They don't feel like they qualify. So they keep going back home to do like different prayers. And yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. We're going to get into that, but that's literally, they would have purification rituals, essentially, where they have to re-Indianize themselves effectively. And they typically bring back a lot of stuff that they use to pray with as well when they're back home. But they also go, I remember at least once a year, like my family friends would go just to pray. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, that is, that is precisely true. Um, so in addition to those cultural issues, right, uh, or I guess religious issues from that, there were also concerns that a number of Indian cultural practices were under threat. Like one of the ones that you even talked about in your podcast before was the sati, like varying things. There were different religious and cultural practices that were being banned that for some were good. For others, it was horribly offensive that it was happening. Like banning the sati? Like banning sati. Was offensive? Yes, to okay. some groups, particularly among more- The really devout. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, also overtaxation, the East India company was overtaxing a lot of the population. And remember, this isn't a territory. How does the company tax the population of a country that they technically are? What? Because they were in charge of many of these places. They were like the East India company for over a century at that point had been the literal rulers of Bengal. Like they were the rulers of it. And so you combine all that with taxation issues, the cultural issues, the religious issues, and natural, of course, colonial snobbery and institutional racism that they had to deal with. And yeah, the Sepoys are going to have a lot of different grievances, which they, despite in many circumstances, would peacefully protest. This wasn't something that was being addressed by the East India Company. They did not give a shit. And so there had been multiple smaller uprisings since the early 1800s. That is something that had happened already but they were quashed, right? These were things that were completely crushed. There wasn't really any kind of mass uprising, just isolated incidents. And the sepoys were really not happy about everything that had been going on, especially pay. Remember, money and soldiers, big deal. If you're wondering how bad this potentially is, you know how inflation is a thing, right? No, yeah. never heard of it. <laughs> so the sepoys' pay had not gone up for 50 years. 
That's not, oh, well, technically they were in charge. So I guess it was legal. Mm -hmm. So the same pay and the same thing happened in Rome, right? There was a key point in which the inflation of the denarii is that the pay of a legionnaire from like, all, like 50 years previously or 100 years previously had not changed. And this led to massive problems once Roman coinage became less and less valuable. So did they revolt because the pay they, was stagnant? Oh, that's, Guys, take notes, take notes, take that's some one notes. Of the so you know how bad that is? You're thinking like, oh yeah, it's not like modern inflation with modern systems, right? So it's like, what? It's going to be a 10% difference, 20% difference? Have you difference? seen the cost of a house in like 1970 versus the cost of a house today? And then the average wage in 1970 versus the average wage today. Also the average cost of groceries versus, you know yes. what? I can go on all day. Yeah, <laughs> even when adjusted for inflation, that's the key part. They always show those charts with adjusted for inflation because people go, oh yeah, but money doesn't have the same value. Yeah, no, it literally doesn't have the same value. It's even less. That's the problem. The, and so the, in addition to that, from what we've described, their pay over the course of 50 years had lost about half of their value. And it still was the same. That is bad. So all of these things are going on. And I wanted to talk about that moment for the, uh, oh God, why am I drawing a blank on it now? The purification rituals, that thing that we were talking yeah. about before. Okay, so doing those purification rituals, that costs money. You have to be able to get all the right types of incense, like the, the, the incense. You have to be able to get the right type of pure holy water, like from the Ganges. You have to get all these varying things that are needed in order to perform the ritual, and that costs money. What happens when your pay stays the same and it loses all value? You won't have the money to do the purification rituals when you did have the time to go back. Which means that not only can you basically not afford to eat, but even when you die, your soul was not cleansed. That's really messed up, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a whole incident in 1824 where sepoys were told to go to Burma by a sea route in order to be able to fight for the company. They refused to do this, like the entire group just refused to do this. But they did agree that they would go if they were allowed to go by land. Because from that sense, I guess the logic of it is that they're, since they're still maintaining contact with the earth, it's not like really leaving. But by traveling overseas, like literally going over the ocean to get to Burma, then that is something that would violate them. And the result of it was that the company had them severely punished. And the issue did not go away. In 1856, the company passed a new law that stated every new person who took employment with the company's army had to agree to overseas service if required. So and they had to go no matter what. They had to go no matter what. Yes. So it's basically the military. It's basically the military. That's just what would end up happening. But it's even worse considering what it is that it would deal it's with because it doesn't corporate. care. Yes. Actually, it's a corporate military. <laughs> All right. And I know the jokes that a bunch of people are going to say in there, but we're just going to circle back in the new year about that invasion in France. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So just following up about the strike on Burma. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to be there by end of day. OK, so the final straw of it, though, as we talked about, was the introduction of greased cartridges for the Enfield rifles that they were using. The animal fat, which is typically coming from the grease of a pig or a cow, would offend Hindu or Muslims, respectively, since the belief that if you have cartridges that are prepared by mouth, in this scenario, it will literally damn them to a, like eternal punishment. The cartridge rumor would fuel other rumors, such as that the sepoy flour that was being used in order to make their bread and other things was using salt that had been deliberately, not accidentally from any kind of preparation process, deliberately contaminated with pig and cow blood. Wait, that, so this was not a rumor. This was fact. That, that, no, that was a rumor that was going around here as well. You know what the really stupid slash screwed up, but funny in a tragic way part of it is? The salt actually did have a red tinge to it. But that is something but, that uh, came some from salt the does. sap. Well, yeah, but this, this didn't, was not natural. That became the color leached onto it because the sacks that the salt was being transported in had a reddish hue. So it was leaching the color off of the sacks into the salt. And people were like, oh, my God, it's blood. And they're doing this to poison us slash damn us. Their KPI should have really focused on spreading less rumors. Yeah, no, see, here's the big problem, though. That no one was communicating. Remember the whole idea of the segregation that was occurring between the European officers and the everyday rank and file. 
they weren't talking to each other. Why would they interact with each other? Who gives a crap about what the rank and file natives yeah. think? I, their leadership system was kind of bad because you, in order to lead people effectively, you probably should get to mm-hmm. know them a little bit. Yep, but didn't happen really. So the result of that is the construction of a massive powder keg that at any given moment could explode. But uh, all of it was, I mean, apart from the pay, the really bad stuff, like the religious stuff, was mainly on. Rumors. Yes, correct. But those were really bad ones. Yes, they were really bad. And they just weren't really addressed. Nothing really happened. So they didn't go, hey, are you tainting our bullets and salt? Many of them wouldn't believe otherwise. That's Valid. the thing. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Because why would you trust the guy who wants nothing to do with you? He's just in charge of you. Correct. That's fair. Yes. And so there were a lot of other points that people were discontent about and a lot of other issues. Like 1857 would see pretty much the complete collapse of the Mughal Empire, which had been, to be fair, I want to do a podcast episode on that. That had been crumbling for quite a while. But it's the way that it ruled over India at this point was pretty much dead. All the varying little princely states and everything that were in there were subservient to the East India Company, no longer the old Mughal Empire. And in many places, they were very unhappy. See, some princes during this time period had actually done pretty well for themselves because what they did is they rented out the East India Company armies in order to fight their own little rebellions and wars and other things that they had. But the result of that was that they owed the East India Company favors and money. We're talking about a system right here that is, if we're to draw this to anything, remember how we did the episode on Al Capone? Yeah. It's basically a bunch of princes that have to pay this company protection money in order to be able to use their armies. What did the East India Company actually do? The East India Company did everything. It was a government. It was an, like it was a trading company. It was a private military corporation. It was literally everything. It was a country. It wasn't a company. Basically, what it is. Yes, that's what it pretty much came. Yeah, it was. It was. And another massive... Con- point of contention that people really had with this that was an issue was that the East India Company would, if a uh, princely state could not pay back its debts, or maybe if it was just in the way, the company would just take it over. Like they would take over one of these little states. Indian princes, in many circumstances, were not being allowed to pass on the territories that they had to their adopted children. Because like, let's say one of the things happened, right? Like, you know how you literally just talked about the drama that's going on in South Korea right now, where there's the company LG. LG. Yeah, yeah, the succession issue because he, he didn't have an older son, so he adopted like a brother's son, and that son was set to inherit everything. But he took the inheritances of the former CEO's like daughters and wife in order to pay inheritance tax because it's ridiculously expensive. So now they don't have any money because he took their money, and it's a whole thing. There's lawsuits going, messy. Mm-hmm. So. What ends up happening with a lot of these is that, let's say you're an Indian prince, you have one son and four daughters, and your son dies, but you need a son that is able to take things over. So you try to adopt the like child of your, of your brother or something, like you try to adopt your nephew as your own kid. The East India Company could step in and go, mm, no, 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 see, that's not your child. Therefore, the inheritance doesn't get passed How down. How would they which know? Means How invested were they? In very every- invested. That's wild. They were involved in everything and everyone at this point. They were everything. And so this was pretty much just a massive like land grab that would happen time and time again in order to be able to get the company to take over more territory. But it's not just the nobles at this point that are suffering for it. It's like the, the, the locals are simultaneously having their own issues. Ever since the 1793 Bengal Permanent Settlement, the East India Company had been drastically expanding who it was taxing, how much it was taxing, what it was taking from the locals, even when there was an actual crisis or famine or something that was going on. Imagine not raising pay, but increasing taxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many Indians weren't really happy with what was going on with the British justice system. They didn't like all the taxes and things that were being imposed on them. And with the removal of a lot of the former states that had existed with their own separate judicial systems, this meant that everything was now subservient to the British and all those other systems that would have existed before, like the patronage ones for having to uh, work as a servant for this prince or the way that, um, God, I can't even begin to explain it. But when they would remove that administration, that system of power, it removed a lot of employment for even many of the 
middle class ish educated people that would have been working in that territory, too. Oh, because if they remove the government, then they implement their own government with their own people who that had is to be occupied British. by Europeans. There you go. So then there were no actual roles for the local people who might have had a higher status than the average peasant. Correct. Right. And the people who arguably got hit the worst, and this is a common thing that is brought up with any kind of thing with Indian nationalism that was occurring at the time, was the artisans, particularly the weavers. India was, for most of history, the largest producer of textiles in the world. And then the East, in not East India Company, then the Industrial Revolution rolls around with Europe, and all of a sudden, the Europeans are able to produce drastic amounts of much higher quality cloth at a much cheaper price, which in turn means that all those people that were the artisanal workers get driven out of business because they just simply couldn't compete, which means that instead of producing manufactured goods, they now have to become cash crop farmers and raise their own kind of cotton to sell to the British to produce those goods that drove them out of business in the first place. That's where we get to the big problems. Those weren't big problems? So, okay, now we're getting into the really dirty stuff. Lord William Benedict. This was the individual that was the ben Benedict? Benedict? It's going to sound weird no matter how it is that I'm saying this guy's name. But anyway, he was the governor general of the East India Company from 1828. And he was known for his rather drastic social reforms for the time. Most notoriously or famously, I guess it depends upon what perspective you really have of it. Most people would probably say that at least this one was a pretty good idea. The, the uh, abolition of the sati. Yeah, the abolition of sati. Basically where the wives were killed along with their husbands. So if a wife was married to a man and he died, even if the wife was really young and he was much older, they would expect her because the wives were supposed to want to go with their husbands. To but serve them. I'm imagining a decent amount maybe wouldn't have wanted to, but I guess he abolished that. and Pissed off a, a, a number of hardline religious people. It's just really interesting because they would burn the husband's body and then the wife was just expected to chill on the fire too. I mean, she wouldn't be chilling. She'd be baking, but <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to say it. <laughs> the look of annoyance. No one who's listening to the podcast right now can see it, but her eyes, I could just see them twitching underneath her eyelids. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah, it essentially people were not really happy with what was going on, the denigration of cultural values, the um, the removal of others, the introduction of Western missionaries. It just it wasn't something that many people were very happy about, combined with all the other literal on the ground issues that were occurring with pay, among everything else. It was changing their politics. It was changing their religion. It was changing their culture. It was changing probably everything about how their daily life worked. It wasn't just like, oh, we're going to be working within your borders. It was, we're taking it over. They were taking their land. At rapid rates too. Very so, rapidly. Obviously, I can understand when people were like, no. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that all this is happening, it, with all the other issues, there's not just going to be one thing that is going to set it off. It is a large powder keg that is being built up, but eventually there is going to be a spark that just kind of sets everything off. And that incident is with the punishment of a man by the name of Mangal Pandey. And this is something that would occur in March of 1857. See, Pandey was this guy, one of these, uh, one of these sepoys, who had wounded a European officer near Calcutta. And for his crime, he was executed. For wounding him. For wounding him. Now, this was something, of course, like if he had attacked his officer or something like that, wounding him, it's like, okay, if you literally attack your officer and do something like that, especially back in the day, that's firing squad. Like that is, that is something that could be treason, mutiny, whatever. That is, that is grounds for execution. You do not mess around with stuff like that in the military, which understand. It's not the real military. <laughs> yeah. But still, that is something that I will say at least that is somewhat understandable, right? Because that happens with militaries all over the world throughout history. There was a bigger problem, though, that occurred from this because Pande wasn't the only person that was punished. Despite the fact that he had wounded his officer, in order to make an example of the other sepoys so that they wouldn't try and do the same thing, um, it was decided that his entire company was also going to be flogged. Reasonable. 
So this was collective punishment, not even just like, oh, they're all going to go out for like a 10 mile march or something is like extra duty or something. No, no, no. They were all whipped. Like you're. Nope. Nope. That is interesting. That is an interesting choice. And so this happens. And then on the 10th of May, 1857, the East India Company sepoys that were located at Mary Root then rose up in rebellion. They protested the 10-year prison sentences that were handed down to 85 fellow sepoys for refusing to use the cartridges that we were talking about that were greased. And the mutineers then turned around and killed their British officers and then went on a straight up rampage. Okay, that went out of hand real fast. Oh, we went out of, yeah. Why were they handing out such harsh punishments? You wouldn't think like the execution, the threat of being executed would be enough. They didn't have to flog the entire company. I'm sure nobody was going to do that. So within states that are ruling over authoritatively, I guess you could say, like- th- They rule by of, fear and breaking spirits, but like they didn't break their spirits enough. No, clearly, and th- but that's usually what ends up happening. These kinds of also, things never end up lasting forever. When you're greatly outnumbered, you can't break anyone's spirit enough to not realize that you're greatly outnumbered. Mm-hmm. So what ends up happening then is this occurs on the 10th. By the 11th, the very next day, they captured the city of Delhi. Like they capture one of the largest cities in all of India right there. And they murder every single European man, woman, and child that they can find, as well as any Indians who had converted to Christianity. So they just wanted to get rid of Western. Yes, they, this is where they are going on the full-on rampage, right? The very next wow. day on the 12th of May, Badur Shan, this is, the, um, this is the guy who was the previous Mughal emperor who was like, what, was he 84, 85? He was in his 80s at the time that all this happens, right? He was not allowed to pass on the title of Mughal emperor onto, like, his, uh, like, onto another person. The title was going to end with him, and he was not happy about that. So the sepoys end up putting him in charge. But he's not really in charge. The first audience that he gets to host here was attended by many different excited sepoys who treated him not as an emperor, but rather as one of them, a familiar, a friend, even disrespectfully. So this guy, this this Bahadur Shah, he was incredibly dismayed by everything that was going on because remember, the sepoys have now broken in and they're murdering every single man, woman, and child that they can find that is European, as well as any of the Christians that are in there. And in addition to that, they are looting everything. So it was just city. disarray. It was basically anarchy. But then he's in charge of it as a figure. Yes. And he, so, did he let, well, he was 80 something. He had to just let it happen. Pr- pretty much. And that's one of the big problems that was going on here, right? He didn't want any of this to happen, but he had to give his public support to the rebellion or else who knows what could happen to him. Only a few days later, on the 16th of May, sepoys and palace servants then went and killed 52 British individuals who were being held prisoner within the palace or who had been discovered hiding in the city. And the killings took place under a tree in front of the palace, despite the fact that he was protesting it the entire time. What it seems that the goal of this just absolute carnage and killing was to do was to force his hand to stay with the rebellion. Because the more destruction that occurs, because he offered his support, he can't then turn around and try and offer terms of peace to the British. He has to fight. Also, if they kill people in front of the palace, they'd assume, oh, no, he's cool with it. He's just executing people now. Correct. This way, there was going to be no way that they could actually turn around and then make like, you know, a compromise of some kind. Like that wasn't going to be able to happen. Exactly as you say. Now, East India Company was not prepared for this at all. They had no idea that any of this crap was going to be happening because this was literally their own military that was going to be revolting against them, right? This saw the sepoys promote the retired Mughal emperor to like to be in charge, as we said, and it spread spontaneously, it seems, all across varying parts of India. It didn't just involve the sepoys, right? It wasn't just the military. We're talking varying landlords, merchants, farmers, Hindu and Muslim alike. Everyone is rising up. Not everyone. Of course, because it's not like the majority of the population supported it in the first place. But it is a large rebellion that is spread pretty, I'm not going to say evenly, but it is definitely spread among the varying classes. It's not like it's isolated to just one particular group or one area. There is public support all over the country. Because all different groups were affected by the East India Company. Correct. And to give an example of how much we're talking about here, Bengal was one of the key strongholds of the East India Company, and they had major problems. They had 74 sepoy regiments, 
And of those 74, 45 of their sepoy regiments there rebelled. Over half. As a precaution, 24 of the remaining 29 sepoy regiments ended up getting disbanded and then disarmed by the EIC before they could do anything. Because who knows, maybe any one of those are not actually going to remain loyal and they're going to rise up. The Bengal cavalry regiments also mutiny. But fortunately for the British, in the East India Company's other two main centers of power, in Madras and Bombay, they didn't have the same kind of issues. The former army there remained loyal, and only two regiments that were part of the latter one in Bombay also rebelled. So really, it was only in Bengal that you saw the largest amount of this occur. The Sepoy cause was then taken up by a host of other Indian princes who were not happy with the fact that the East India Company had been screwing things over in their region for years. One of the examples that we have up here is Queen Rani Lakshmi Bai of Jhansi and Nana Sahib, who were claimants to the Maratha title of Peshwa. And these were examples of rulers who had actually risen up directly against the company and threw their support behind the rebels. Some princes did still remain loyal, such as the Maharajas of Gwalior and Jodhpur, of which I'm probably mispronouncing, no, so I know that anyone is going to probably start roasting me for this. <laughs> but even if the princes remained loyal, or even if the princes rebelled, there were still splits among their soldiers of some soldiers still remained loyal, other soldiers rebelled. So it was causing splits and little civil wars in varying regions, even within princes that stayed loyal. So you never knew exactly what was going to be happening because a lot of the middle class merchants and other people on the ground, they didn't want to rebel because when destruction came and all this rebellion and looting and everything came to their region, who do you think was going to be the ones that were going to be primarily affected? The merchants. Correct. They were going to be losing out on everything. And so the majority of people didn't even remain loyal. They didn't even remain they didn't even rebel. They were rebel. neutral. They were neutral. Exactly. Sorry, I'm, I'm mispronouncing. I'm bumbling over my words. But yes, they, they remained neutral. That was the majority of people. They just didn't want to be caught up in any of it. So the rebellion continued to spread with remarkable speed. And this was helped by agents that were being sent out from the rebels to specifically try to entice people to join in that, with them because the more success that they had, the more likely it was that someone else was going to end up joining them and they wanted to spread this. Because for many of these people, the, the rebels didn't really have anything to lose. Most of northern and central India was up in rebellion, especially around the Ganges and Narmanda valleys. And as the East India Company mobilized loyal troops, fighting started to break out at Banaras, Walor, Jhansi, Kampur, Lucknow, and others. There were more rebellions that would occur in other regions as well, such as Assam, Rajasthan, and Punjab. But... These were some of the main areas where the fighting would occur. Problem was, this was all their sepoys. This was the military that was uprising, not the peasants. Though the peasants would obviously end up joining in for a number of varying spots. So that means that the East India Company didn't really have many troops that they were actually going to be able to use to fight. So where are they going to get some? Well, the answer is kind of strange. They had recently gotten, in just a couple years earlier, new additional conquests and regiments that had came from Sikh territories as well as the Gurkhas in Nepal. Do you remember when we did that special episode that was on the, uh, on the Gurkhas and their origin and we talked about the Nepalese and how they were actually very aggressive? So those regiments that had earned the respect of the British, who actually really loved them and thought they were awesome, end up coming in shortly after all those wars occurred, and now they're fighting on the side of the British against their own forces. Wow. That previously would have been fighting the Nepalese. So it's like round two for them. They get to go again, except this time they're under the command of the East India Company. Here's, here's the thing. This still means that there is rebellions everywhere. And Delhi was taken very quickly. The problem for the East India Company now was that they were going to have to take Delhi, which is going to bring us to the Grand Siege. So the Siege of Delhi, it really became clear rather quickly to the East India Company that they weren't going to be able to take Delhi quickly 
it was way too fortified. There was way too many troops. There was way too much anything for a direct attack. You couldn't launch a quick strike and overwhelm them because there were simply too many defenders. Even if technically speaking, the company had better equipment at the time and the ability to actually resupply. But that's going to become a crucial factor. The East India Company technically had all the time in the world because the manufacturing, everything that would be needed to actually supply a modern army, none of that was located in India. All that stuff was coming from overseas. So large contingents of rebellious sepoys and volunteers would continue to arrive in Delhi as the days would come, but that means less and less equipment and food and everything else that can be distributed amongst the more people that arrive. So it's also a numbers game and a little bit of a waiting game. The majority of no less than 10 regiments of cavalry, along with 15 of infantry of the Bengal army, would rebel and make their way all the way to Delhi during June and July, along with large numbers of irregulars. The irregulars that we're talking about were ones who were not necessarily part of the main, like, sepoy force. They would have been serving ahead as, uh, like, scouts or, like, warriors that were temporarily employed. We're talking, like, the, um, the religious warriors, the mujahideen. Remember, like, if you heard that term for a lot yeah. of the stuff for the holy Muslim warriors, and as each new contingent arrived, the rebels would make multiple attacks on the British forces that were encamped outside of the city day after day after day. And a major attack that they end up launching from three different directions on the 19th of June nearly forced the defenders, well, I guess not defenders, the offenders. The people that were laying the siege. <laughs> you, you know what it is that I mean. So they were defending if they were, wait, no, they were the, the offenders. Yeah. yeah. The attackers. The, the temporary defenders were, <laughs> were exhausted by this point. And this, they were almost made to retreat, but they didn't. They held on slightly. And if, if the rebels had just attacked one more time, they potentially would have driven them off. They didn't know how close they were to success in this regard. But although the attacks were beaten off, the besiegers were ground down. They were exhausted. They were suffering horribly from disease at this point. Conditions on the ridge upon which they were located were very unhealthy and unpleasant. The guy who was in charge of the location, like the guy who was leading the siege of Delhi, General Bernard, he died of cholera on the 5th of July, which you remember how cholera gets, um, gets not develops, transmitted. Like through, through bad drinking water. And when you're in a siege camp and your drinking water is filthy and contaminated, this is what they had. But he wasn't the only one. His successor, a man by the name of Reed, also got stricken with cholera and was then forced to hand over command to Archdale Wilson, who was then promoted to major general. And although Wilson tried to do a variety of things to help the camp, like clear the unburied corpses that were just laying around everywhere and the other refuse, like the literal feces and other stuff that would have been around the territory to remove it from the ridge. Yeah, um, this wasn't something that was going to be so easy to do. He was scarcely capable of exercising command. And in every single letter that he wrote back to the company and to Britain, he was constantly complaining about being exhausted. Like we have his letters and his letters are just him bitching and moaning about like the conditions and how awful they were. He hates it. Oh, I feel bad for the guy. He did not want to be there. No, but again, the British were not beaten. They did manage to hold on. There was one vital area of India, the Punjab, where they had actually managed to maintain more control than what you would normally expect. This was annexed by the East India Company only eight years earlier. So you would think that in a region like that, this territory is going to have way less loyalty to the to the company. They're more likely to rebel. But no, the Bengal native units that were there were very quickly disarmed in order to prevent them from rebelling, or they were defeated when they tried, and it didn't work. Most of the available company units were stationed there, along with units of the Punjab Irregular Force, which were formed from Sikhs as well as Pakhtuns, who had very little in common with the Hindus of the Bengal Native Infantry. Like, they just, they they didn't. There was no real reason for them to side with them, because this is one of the things that a lot of people don't really get when talking about India and history, because they think of India as a country, as a cultural monolith, even with its religious differences. But that's not true. India is composed of 
thousands of different languages and cultures and all different things of people who were competing with one another for literally thousands of years. There's very few times in its history in which it was united. And so these guys, they didn't care. Like for them, it's like, okay, yeah, no, we're just, this is a new Lord or whatnot that we're serving under the company. We have nothing in common with the Bengals who are trying to rebel here. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to put them down. And that's pretty much how that goes. And so as the situation in the Punjab stabilized, units could then be sent from there in order to reinforce the besiegers at Delhi. Also, the ruler of a couple of the other states, like the states of uh, Patalia, Jind, and Naba, they were then made to support the East India Company and sent contingents of their own armies, because they still had their own private military forces, in order to try and secure the lines of communication between the besiegers and Punjab, thus establishing a kind of base of operations, if you will, something that is going to allow them to control. This is where the tides are going to slightly begin to turn. Because the first reinforcements to arrive at Delhi are the Corps of Guides, which is a very interesting name, and I thought that was so cool. I kind of want to do a short on them. These individuals made a massive forced march that was several hundred miles during the hottest season of the year, which also coincided with the month of Ramadan. So for anyone who may not understand the significance of that, a, a large contingent of this force was Muslim. And during Ramadan, you fast. You fast. I mean, like typically not even having water. Yeah, correct. So you can't really exert yourself because there's no way to replenish anything until you break your fast, like at night, essentially, like after sundown. So these guys would march, a forced march, double time through the hottest days of the year, all day, and would only then be allowed to eat and drink at night. That's and it. then they'd have to wake up super early to eat and drink in the morning before the sun came. That is exhausting. Yes. Now you see why I thought that was so cool. Like tough, horrible, but also incredibly cool that they were able to do this in the first place. That is some strength. So either way, they leapt into action the moment they arrived, even after this big force, and started immediately building up things on the ridge. The major force that was dispatched from Punjab to Delhi was a flying column, something that was composed of 4,200 men under the control of Brigadier John Nicholson, along with a siege train. This doesn't mean an actual train. A siege train is the, the baggage train that would be following with all the supplies, the artillery pieces, everything that would actually be needed in order to lay siege to like a castle or something, right? And Nicholson would arrive himself on the 14th of August. The rebels had heard that a siege train was coming in. And so they sent out their own force in order to try and intercept it. And on the 25th of August, Nicholson would lead a force against their position at the Battle of Najafar. Not, 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 it's a name that I can't really pronounce in here, and I apologize. But this battle was not going to go well for the, not besiegers, not even the attackers. I'm getting confused on how I'd even phrase that. The people within Delhi, it didn't go well for them. Although the monsoon had broken, the roads and the fields were flooded. And so Nicholson drove his force to make a rapid march and afterwards completely took them by surprise and got an easy victory. Thus, from that, raising European morale and lowering that of the rebels. Because remember, prior to this, the rebels were appearing everywhere. They were taking all this territory. They were rapidly doing everything. So there was like a continuous morale build that was now broken. It was no longer going to be victories. So the siege train would then arrive at the beginning of September, comprised of six 24-pounder guns, eight 18-pounder long guns, six 8-inch howitzers, and four 10-inch mortars with almost 600 ammunition carts. Gabby, that's, that's not saying that that's 600 pieces of ammunition. Those are 600 carts that are filled with just black powder, like explosive bombs and stuff that they're going to be using. Why would it be 600 ammunition pieces? Oh, <laughs> they so for real. Delhi was extremely well fortified. We're talking about an ancient capital within India that was one okay. of the most heavily defended positions. Here's the thing. Who is in Delhi? Because you've, you've made it so confusing. <laughs> the, the, okay, it's, it's all the Bengal regiments. And so here's what would happen, right? The rebellion occurs. All these Bengal regiments and everyone that is around that they start congregating toward, 
towards a major point. They overtook Delhi the next day. Like literally this occurs on what? The, the 10th of May. And then the next day after that, the 11th, they take Delhi. Immediately, all these other rebels start hearing about, okay, hey, we took Delhi. We took the major okay, city. And then they start, and they start there. congregating there. Gotcha. So that's where it is. A lot of forces are So they're the defenders. Yes, they're they are defending the Delhi. I got confused even when I was trying to explain it because the defenders kept on attacking. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> so confusing. defenders in Delhi and then the attackers are the besiegers. We're are the, the besiegers. Okay, yes. the besiegers are the EIC and the besiegers are getting attacked by the defenders. Yes. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. Now you see why this is such a confusing mess with the, when this is happening. No, no, it's great. It's great. I was just like rereading all the notes to be like, who is in Delhi? <laughs> uh, so yes. So. From the arrival of additional guns, because the siege train brings a lot more of these cannons, more firing positions are then able to be set up, and the batteries just start laying down withering fire constantly on the city, day and night, with 50 different sets of guns that are going at this. And the walls begin to crumble. The opening stage of what we're talking about here, right, with the siege, it also seems to have occurred at the same time that all the supplies within the actual city of Delhi were starting to run out. And they have nowhere to get more supplies. Correct. Unless they were to successfully raid more EIC camps. Correct, yes. But if they, they won't be able to do that without weapons, so good luck. Chuck. Correct. That's why it becomes this game of almost a waiting game where it becomes a major trouble because they lo the, the EIC realized that, hey, the fire that is coming from the defenders as we bring up our cannons in our position and actually try to attack them it's getting less and more sporadic by the day. There's less and less, which means that they can't actually use it. They're having to conserve more of their ammunition. When you combine this with uh, individuals that are being uh, bribed within the city in order to be able to sabotage things, there were multiple cases of spies that were going in and identifying defeatist rumors. So in other words, people inside were starting to think, okay, hey, we, um, we're not actually going to be able to hold this. This is starting to give the East India Company the idea of launching an attack. They're not going to wait out forever because the longer that the rebe rebellion goes on, the greater the chance that someone else is going to rise up as well. They need to take this as quickly as possible, even if they're trying to outweigh things. So the first three columns under Brigadier General Nicholson's overall command would then gather in a building, or would gather in and behind a building known as the Kudisya Bagh. This was a territory, or not a territory, this was a building that was one of the former summer residences of the Mughal kings where they ruled over the territory and was about a quarter of a mile from the north walls. A fourth column, while these three would launch from there, was supposed to attack the city only when the Kabul gate on the west of the city walls would open from behind by the other columns. There would be a fifth column as well, and the cavalry that would be held in reserve that, if needed, would be able to go and launch their own strike. The attack that they decided to launch would go off at dawn. But by the time that they actually decided to attack, the defenders had managed to rebuild enough of their walls and territory there because, you know, they're making all these cracks in, this, in the siege wall. They're stacking sandbags, chairs, carts, literally anything that you can think of. They are stacking in this gap in the walls in order to make sure that the enemy can't get inside. So instead of attacking at dawn, further bombardment was then required. Eventually, Nicholson would give the signal and the attackers, which are called the besiegers here, would charge. The first column would storm through the breach in the Kashmir Bastion and the second through the water bastion that was by the Juma River. But this was not easy. As most of the scaling ladders that they had built in order to try and climb the walls that remained there in the first place ended up being broken before they could be put in place. The third column would end up attacking the Kashmiri Gate on the north wall. And when this would occur, oh my God. Okay, so I'm reading through this. Uh, I'm finding so many different examples of the actions of what people are launching. There were two officers in there, these two British guys. They were sappers. And remember what I've explained siege tactics? The sapping is when you like build or dig underneath a wall and then you put explosives under it? Yeah. Okay. So you had lieutenants home and Sackled, both of which from their actions here would eventually win the Victoria Cross. They led a suicide mission into it 
with a small party of British and Indian sappers that placed four gunpowder charges and sandbags against the gate while under fire from literally just 10 feet away. Like there are people firing at them from 10 feet away from like where we are in this room. Like they're, it's over by the Christmas tree that's over there and they're shooting guns at us. And we were running in, throwing down a bunch of explosives, lighting that, and then getting the hell out of Dodge. You say we, but you ain't gonna catch me doing that. Well, no, no, okay. I completely understand that. The explosion that occurred from this, and mind you, they both survived from this. They, this was a suicide mission and they still did it. What? Yeah. The explosion demolished part of the gate and a bugle then signaled that everyone else was supposed to charge. And the third column launched their strike. Which side note on this, before we go ahead and go into an ad break, because I have to say this, because I, I, doing the research, I found this whole thing on the Holmes guy. His medal, is he won the Victoria Cross, the highest honor. That's like the medal of honor that you could get for Britain. His medal ended up being lost years later by the children of the guy who owned it in the later years. The original medal was lost in 1920 when children of the then owner were playing with it by playing soldiers in a nearby field and it fell off of them and they lost it. And despite years upon years of searches, no one has ever found it. You can't get like a replacement medal? Well, they did. So this, we're talking about the original medal. So the original Victoria Cross medal that he earned from launching the suicide mission um, is lost forever. I mean, they were playing soldiers with an authentic medal. Not many people no, can get that they same. Were, they weren't playing with like a paper mache thing or like a rock that was supposed to represent it. No, they were playing soldiers and used an actual Victoria Cross. That is like the equivalent, considering the time, because it's 1920. This occurred yeah. in the 1850s. That is the equivalent of me pulling out a Medal of Honor earned in like the Korean War and losing it. Like, what the hell? <laughs> and if anyone were to lose something like that, it would be you. Oh, gee, thank you. So anyway, back to the battle after the whole metal being lost thing here. Right. Okay. So meanwhile, the fourth column would go and enter the, um, or they would go and enter the city and encounter a rebel force inside of the suburb of the Kishengunj, which yes, I'm probably mispronouncing this, but this was a territory that was outside of the Kabul gate before the other columns attacked. And this was something that did not go well. It was completely thrown in disorder. Major Reed, who was its commander, was seriously injured and the column was forced to retreat. The rebels then followed up, and when they counterattack, would manage to capture four guns from the Kashmiri troops. Oh. Yes, which is going to give them access to more weapons. This then allowed them to threaten to attack the British camp, which had been already emptied of most of its guard forces because the troops were now deployed in order to be able to form the assault force. So in spite of all of this happening, in spite of this reversal of fortunes, Nicholson, the guy who was the overall commander of this, he still wanted to continue to press on into the city. So he led a detachment down this narrow alley in order to try, or not alley, like a lane, like within one of the streets, in order to capture the Burn Bastion, which is one of these locations on the walls north of the, of the Kabul gate. Rebel soldiers were holding most of the flat rooftops, because remember, it's not like houses that we would see like in our suburb or whatnot on top of the roofs, it's just, it, it, it's a flat thing. So you can stand on top of there like its own kind of platform. And they were standing up top there with their own guns and mounted guns in order to be able to fire grape shot onto the soldiers that were marching in through these lanes. And you remember what grape, grape shot, shot is like. Yeah, like scatter pellets essentially. Yes. Maybe little balls. Gigantic shotgun, except the balls inside of it are the size of golf balls. Yeah, not pleasant at all. So after two rushes that they try to launch end up getting completely stopped with heavy casualties, Nicholson then decides, I'm going to lead the third charge myself. And this is the overall commander of the forces. The one who was complaining a lot, right? Um, or is that Reed? Th that, that, was the, that was the previous guy. Okay. That was the previous guy. Nicholson ends up taking charge in here. I'm pretty sure it was him. So he takes charge. He launches his strike and he gets shot and is mortally wounded. He doesn't die immediately, but... But this, he does die he, eventually. He does end up dying from this. This what is where he would get mortally wounded. Made him think that they failed twice and he should just be the one. He can do it. He's like, I can fix it. The territory, it, it had to be taken. And the problem that usually happens that. with this is that let's say you get repulsed twice, the soldiers aren't willing to go anymore. So the commander then takes charge and instead of like 
Shoo, guys, shoo. I'm, don't worry, guys. I'm right back here. You all go ahead. It'll be totally fine. Instead, he has to lead by example and actually lead the charge himself in order to get people to go with him. But now if your commander is mortally wounded, I can't imagine morale is through the roof. No. So they were repulsed from this, and the British then had to withdraw to the Church of St. James that was just inside the walls of the Kashmir Bastion. They had suffered 1,170 casualties in this attack, which is bad. Archdale Wilson then moved to the church and faced with this whole setback, he tried to order a withdrawal. He tried to retreat. They wanted to leave. Like, he did not want to be participating in this anymore. And here's the big kicker. Remember how Nicholson didn't die? He was mortally wounded? Yes. So he's laying there, bleeding out in this, like, temporary hospital thing that has been set up. And when he hears of Wilson's indecision of, like, oh, should I go? Should I stay? Should I do? Oh, what should I do? The dying Nicholson, who is literally on his deathbed, says, and I quote, I will shoot you if you try to retreat. <laughs> he did not want, like, he's he like, up, if I'm dying, we're all dying together. <laughs> he threatens Archdale so that if he tries to retreat, he will have him shot. Oh, personally. So other officers then managed to persuade Wilson to hold on to the, the grounds that they had managed to take by that point, And then from there, press onwards. The British and the East India Company forces, they were in complete disorder at this point. A lot of the British officers had been killed or wounded and their, their units were now in confusion. And so the foothold that they had managed to take included a lot of the territory that had many merchant locations here, warehouses. The short of it was that a lot of this were liquor stores where they had um, copious amounts of alcohol that was being stored. And so over the course of the next two days, these soldiers then proceeded to get drunk off their ass <laughs> like for the next two days straight. I mean, there's nothing else they could really do. <laughs> yep. Yep. And so they, this largely made them incapacitated. You think, well, OK, why the hell are the defenders not going to attack now? They had all this opportunity to attack before. Well, the, there's a problem. While the irregulars, like the Mujahideen, they defended their parts of the fortified compound with zealous determination, they simultaneously were so poorly organized that they couldn't launch counterstrikes of their own. And in addition to that, they didn't really have the supplies to do so. Even if they potentially could have taken on the enemy, they didn't have the weapons. They didn't have the gunpowder. They didn't have it necessary. So Wilson eventually... <laughs> Because, you know, this is the smart decision that you have to make at this point. He orders all liquor to be destroyed and discipline to be restored. Because <laughs> you can't be al- drunk. That's like the only thing keeping them going. They've been losing for days. Yep. And so slowly the attackers begin to capture the magazine on the 16th of September. Badur Shah and his entourage would then abandon the palace on the 18th of September. And a British force would capture the Great Mosque, the Jama Masjid, and the abandoned palace the next day. They would also manage to capture the uh, Semelgar fort that was attached to the palace and dominated the bridge of boats that was over the river Yamuna. And most of the rebels who had not already left the city now did so. They fled before the company forces managed to take all the gates that exited out of the city, thus trapping them. The city was then finally declared to be captured on the 21st of September. And guess what? What? Nicholson dies the very next day. He managed to hold on all the way up until the end when the city was actually taken, and only then did it collapse. The rebellion was ultimately quashed by the spring of 1858 for two reasons. Like the Battle of Delhi, this was arguably one of the biggest, most important of any of these things possible. The EIC simply had vastly superior resources. The rebels didn't really have much coordination. They couldn't produce things on their own in order to be able to fight back besides, you know, some of the basic stuff that they would have already been potentially producing for melee weapons. They didn't have the supply lines that would be necessary for a contracted war. And with the fact that the East India Company, although it was on its back foot very quickly, simultaneously, it was able to turn around and reorganize itself particularly fast. All these varying groups that had risen up, They were divided among religious lines. They were divided among cultural lines. They weren't even just for that. They wanted different things. So different regiments, different classifications of people, they would rebel for different things. 
Some of them wanted lower taxes. Some of them wanted to not have to use these cartridges. Some of them wanted just outright independence or some other kind of autonomy or something. There was really no rhyme or reason or organization to the rebellion, with the exception of those that may have been under some of the princes that also rebelled. And because of that, they could be each individually isolated and crushed at will because they weren't coordinating with one another. In the end, 40,000 British soldiers that were shipped from Europe ended up being largely one of the big deciding factors that would swing things over in the EIC's favor. Because even with that small of a force versus the hundreds of thousands that they faced, though they were all isolated all across the country in varying different things that weren't communicating or working together. So you said that the British East India Company is what kind of led to the British Empire stepping in and taking over India. Yes. How? So. Or is that going to be an episode in and of itself? I want to kind of do that as an episode itself, but this, I mean, this is really the big thing that leads into it. It it is. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it outright. When all of this is, when all of this goes over in June of 1858, Lord Canning, who is the governor general of the East India Company by that point, he announces that peace has been restored. And Queen Victoria, because remember, this is the Victorian era at that time, she personally promised amnesty for the rebels. She guaranteed the rights of Indian princes and promised religious toleration for all. So all of those more hardline policies the East India Company had been taking and had been actually implementing, they were revoked or modified. And the crown didn't fully step in at this point, but they did step in to a degree and would gradually increase their control until the East India Company only a few years later was, they, they lost their charter and they were revoked, right? Casualties were high on both sides, but it was way higher on the Indian side. There were 26 or 100 British enlisted soldiers and 157 officers being killed in combat, while 8,000 would end up dying of heat stroke and disease and 3,000 being severely injured. The Indian deaths, we have no way of actually knowing how high it is, but some estimates due to the war and the famines, because remember, all supply lines broke down, which means that trade broke down, which means there was no food shipments to varying locations. Famines sprung up all across the country and maybe as many as 800,000 people died. We don't know. We just don't know. Atrocities and massacres were committed on both sides. Uh, military personnel and civilians in cities and rural areas. There are countless cases of unlawful imprisonment, people being tortured, rape, execution without trial, murder of Indian and European men, women, and children everywhere from all religions. It was a bloodbath in many areas of rage and reprisals again and again and again that led to, for years, a lot of bad feelings between the parties. Respect, like you would understand why that would happen. And so in the aftermath, the East India Company would ruthlessly deal with the rebellion's leaders. Badr Shah II was exiled to Burma because, I mean, he was more of a figurehead at that point, but both of his sons were executed. They, they ended up being like generals within the military and actually fought. So they were, they were executed. Queen Rani Lakshmi Bai was killed in battle. And another prominent rebel leader, the Maratha Tatya Top, was executed. The British would blame largely Muslims more for the rebellion than Hindus because amongst the Bengal regiments, there were a large population of uh, Muslims that had served in there with the whole idea of the grease coming from pigs. Since, you know, cheap animal, easy to produce, the Muslims were initially blamed for the uprising, though the general dislike or hate or persecution would be felt by pretty much all. But they were largely unfairly pressed more than the respective Hindus. There was looting kangaroo courts where people didn't actually have any kind of representation to protect them. They would be strung up in less than like a couple minutes where they were found guilty and then executed. The East India Company saw it getting so bad that here's the big kicker. The company directors had to then go and issue a resolution to its employees saying, hey guys, please show some restraint and stop killing everybody. The British state, already unimpressed with the way the East India Company had been governing things for years at this point. Remember, we talked about all the famines. We talked about everything else that had been occurring. They took the final steps in what has been a gradual process of regulation and control 
to t- finally take full control of the East India Company on the 2nd of August, 1858. Remember what I said earlier? This thing started in 1857 and it went till 1858. Literally within just a little bit of this all ending, they lost everything. The East India Company was wiped. The Sepoy Mutiny was taken as a severe warning that a commercial company with nobody to answer to is probably not a great idea to actually rule a territory. What? I would have never known. Yeah, you don't want a military industrial complex that is just in charge of literally everything. Amazing. So the East India Company Navy was then disbanded, and in June of 1862, the EIC's nine European regiments that it still had were taken over. Though, weirdly enough, it wasn't until 1895 that the various surviving East India Company presidency armies were actually united into one singular British Indian army. And this new army had a much higher percentage of British soldiers than its predecessor, because you didn't want to have that seven to one ratio anymore. Two to one is fine. Seven to one, no. And with that, that was the fall of the East India Company and the end of the Sepoy Rebellion. India would not actually see its full independence then for pretty much a century after that. And that's the end, my friends. Okay, so now for a family history, and I have one from Pixie. And Pixie says, I don't know how interesting this would be to someone who didn't know my grandmother. There are no stories of action or battles. But my grandmother was an amazing woman born in North Wales in 1925. She was about 14 when when World War II started. She told stories about bomb shelters and air raids as her family had moved closer to London for work. She became a volunteer nurse towards the end of the war where she met a U.S. soldier and fell in love and got married at a cathedral a little outside London. They had a daughter over in the UK and she was pregnant with their second child when she went to move to the US after the war's end. Shortly after moving back, she found out her husband had already been married in the US. Wait, what? She left him and started working in a textile mill as a single mother in the late 40s, eventually marrying another man whom she never spoke of despite having another five kids with him. But I know she wasn't fond of him and he either left or died at some point. (laughs) Seeing as she talks about the bigamous soldier, I can only imagine what he was like. Leaving her a Catholic single mother in a foreign country with seven children in the 50s and 60s. I mean, have soldiers, American soldiers, always been like that? Dude, well, I mean, it's a, it's soldiers, yes, but in history, yes. she eventually met the man I call my grandfather when her oldest was in high school. He asked her on a date and she told him she needed another man, like a hole in the head. <laughs> but eventually she married him and she would always say he was the only man actually worth a damn. Aw. She wasn't a politician or a soldier, but she was a strong lady full of fire and grit who made a profound impact on my family. And her story reminds me of all the little parts of the history of history, the average person, especially women, have to persevere through that we don't hear about. She lived out most of the days I knew her, surrounded by spicy romance books and a <laughs> Yorkie named Pebbles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that story, Pixie. She kind of lived out her own spicy romance in a way. A, tra- a bit of a tragic one, but one that ends well. That line, she needed another man like, like a, a hole in, like the, a head. Hole in the head. Wow, I love her. <laughs> Thank you, my friends, for all of you who have been listening. I hope you enjoyed the Christmas episode from this last week. Um, and I hope that you all enjoy everything that is to come, especially in the new year that we're launching since this should be coming out to actually on New Year's. Right? And please make sure to send us more family histories. It could be about anything. It doesn't have to be grand or amazing. We like hearing all of the stories, large and small. We do. Thank you, my friends, my hosts. And goodbye. Bye. <laughs>